to you a little bit today about an idea I have of what we can leave behind in the digital world, what of ourselves we can leave behind. And uh, first I'm going to say what I'm not going to be talking about. Um, I'm not going to be talking about sort of the move today to talk about uploading our consciousness into a computer. So popular movies and, and other writings have kind of popularized that and promoted that idea of uploading our consciousness to a computer and bringing it into a digital form where we get to live on after our death. And um, that's not exactly what I'm going to be talking about. Even though that concept has been around for decades, we can go back to early science fiction to see this. Um, some of these books go back to the 1930s. And of course, the futurists have talked a lot about this. Uh, Ray Kurzweil, Hans Moravec, and there's been a lot of pub publicity about this concept. But I have to say that I see a problem with this kind of idea of uploading our consciousness. It sounds wonderful. Don't we all want to live forever? I think it would be great. But consciousness is tricky. We don't really know what consciousness is yet. We don't know how to reproduce it. We don't know how to do it in a way that, that really preserves that essence of who we are individually. So my proposal is a little more modest, maybe still challenging, but it's an idea I think we can achieve in the next few decades and I call this the ultimate selfie, and it's based on a number of trends that I have been following for some time. Um, so the trends, I'm gonna go into four of them uh, in a little bit of detail, and they include the increasingly quantified self, so the way we're able to uh, really measure ourselves in ways we've never been able to do before, and then also the ability to capture ourselves in very high resolution, capture our appearance. And then the next one is increasing use of avatars. So we all are having avatars that allow us to enter into the digital space and actually inhabit it with an embodied kind of sensibility. And then the last trend is sort of the new ways that people are looking at producing artificial intelligence. So we'll go through um, these one at a time. The first one is the increasingly quantified self. So it's getting more prevalent, less expensive, and increasingly used from our Fitbits to ways that we can measure our brain waves, uh, the ways that we can measure even our internal biomes. We can measure so much of ourselves today. And these sensors that we can put on everywhere are getting smaller and smaller to the point where we're going to be either wearing them, and they won't be as big as this illustration here, but we'll be wearing them ubiquitously on our body. They'll be woven into our clothes. And every aspect of our physiology, of our neurology, can be captured with these in the near future. So I think that's one trend we have to look for. Sure, I think if the stage manager doesn't kill me, I did that. <laughs> Does that work for everybody? Thanks. All right, so the next one is capturing our outward appearance. And the, the ways that we can do this today are so sophisticated. So this is a picture from Paul DeBevick's light stage at the Institute for Creative Technologies, where I was for about 13 years. And this captures not only what you look like, but actually layers of your skin from your dermis to your epidermis and the subsurface scattering of light going down in these layers of skin and coming back out. So when you're scanned in this particular device, you come up with this hyper-realistic version of yourself. And this is used a lot for the film industry to do the digital doubles for the actors. Um, so this is something that's coming down in, um, in cost and in access, and I'll talk more about that in a, in a little bit. But this is going to be your first picture of your baby in, in a couple years. You will be capturing your children and maybe yourselves in full 3D in ways that we'll be able to, to look at those captures and really kind of know what that person was a, a, like. So we already have a form of digital doubles of ourselves, and these are called avatars. So you may not think avatars are actually in use a lot today, unless you've got kids and they're in Minecraft and uh, things like that. But there are virtual worlds where people are increasingly using avatars. You, you will have them in, in the next version of Facebook instead of just your picture. Maybe you'll have an avatar that you'll use with the Oculus Rift. 
So these kinds of social forms of ourselves that can be inhabiting these digital worlds are growing very, very fast. And kids today are very used to having multiple forms of avatars. And these are getting more sophisticated. These images don't look that sophisticated, but just imagine in a couple years when you can be scanned in a light stage or someplace else and then bring that avatar into the digital space. So it really represents your physical form. So this is gonna happen because we are really being immersed in our media more than ever today. Um, the lines between what's physical and what's digital are blurring. What's it gonna be like in 100 years? Well, we're actually, I believe, going to live in these digital realities that we create. We'll be able to seamlessly go between the digital and the physical in ways that we can't even imagine today. I mean, already today you can have a 3D scan of yourself made, and I went to the Consumer Electronics Show last January, and there were at least a dozen, if not more, booths where you could pop into a little device and get a scan of yourself, get your di digital data, and then have a little statue printed out. Um, in fact, a 16-year-old kid I know made a device to do exactly this for about $30. So this is a technology that you'll probably go down to your local FedEx and walk into a booth and have your digital double. And, and this idea that what happens in the physical world can be made digital very easily and then be brought back into a physical space and then brought back into the, into the, the digital realm. Um, already there's a company called 8i that can scan you in full 3D while you're moving. So this actually is a picture of a mother who is giving a heartfelt message, it's about 10 minutes long, to this baby she's holding about how much she loves the baby and how, how she wants the baby to remember that, you know, that they were this mother and baby pair and it's something she wants to leave behind for this baby. These these scans that 8i does, you can walk around, you can put them in a virtual space and you can actually walk around the person while they're talking. And yes, it, it's, it gives me goosebumps. It gave me goosebumps to watch this mother in, in, um, in this virtual reality thing with the head mount on. But the point is that real and imaginary, real and digital, everything's about to enter into a dance where everything is whirling so fast together, we're not gonna be able to tell them apart. It's all gonna be real to us. So I would like to have an avatar that not only is a recording of myself, but actually embodies more of my intelligence. I, this is what I'm calling the ultimate selfie. And to do this, we need new forms of artificial intelligence. Now, this is a project I worked on for the Boston Museum of Science where we made two life-size girl guides. We called them Ada and Grace. And they were the guides to the computer center at the Boston Museum of Science. Now, they were AI agents. The kids came into these life-size um, girls and they could ask them questions. They, could ask, they knew all about the exhibits that were in the computer museum. And beyond that, they knew what it was like to be teenage girls. So you could say, you know, you have a boyfriend? And they would say, what, you know another digital human we should be uh, meeting? Or what's your favorite color? Um, and they gave little science lessons, so one of the favorite colors was white because it was all colors. And they also knew about how they worked under the hood, so they could say how they recognized the voices that the kids were asking questions in, translating them to text, running them through a, a sophisticated um, AI processor, and then coming back with the correct answer and giving that to the kids. And it was really an amazing project. Now, the problem with these kinds of agents is that they don't really learn. So they have the same sort of responses. They might have a, a dozen different ways to say something, but they don't learn. They, they can't say, hi, Sally, I remember when you came in the other day. They usually can't do that. And I really want digital entities that can learn. I want new forms of AI where not only are the agents smart about what they know, but they can also be smart about you, the human who is interacting with them. So this is a project, again, from the Institute for Creative Technologies called SimSensei. And SimSensei, this virtual human, knows exactly what your emotional state is because they are scanning the, the, the facial expressions, the eye tracking, the body movements, and even, you know, if you're doing something like this, they're like, you seem a little agitated. 
So using all of this, and even the voice prosody, they can tell how that real human is, is feeling and reacting to them. And they adjust their body movements, and they adjust the things that they say to build up a rapport with that physical human that is interacting with them. And this is really cool. But again, they don't remember you um, from one form to the next. Now, another interesting AI project that's going on, on um, in New Zealand is Mark Cigar and his Baby X. Baby X is a scan of his daughter, and she's about this old. Um, but her facial animations are all driven by some very sophisticated neurocomputational models that Mark has come up with. And these models integrate theories of social and emotional behavior systems, and he uses them to create what he calls artificial nerve signals to drive the baby's facial muscles. Um, so this is really sophisticated stuff. This baby, when you're interacting with it, can be happy or it can be sad, and if you're not interacting with it, it will enter into a sleep state. But again, this one's not learning a lot yet, maybe, maybe soon. So I really want my digital double, my avatar, to learn while I inhabit it. So when I am in a virtual world as my avatar, I really want that, that entity to know how I'd behave in a situation, to, to understand the experiences I've had as that avatar, and throughout my lifetime, build up a, 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 an AI kind of understanding of me that could live on after me so that, say, my great-grandchildren could come in and talk to me even after I'm gone because this digital entity will really behave as I behaved because it learned from me throughout my lifetime. And, you know, eventually we could, we could connect our neural processes to this. And um, there's just so much potential there. We have a lot of work to do to make this happen. But I really would like to leave this behind for my, um, my future um, children, grandchildren. And so this ultimate selfie, I think, is going to be a, one way we could exist in this dance between the digital and the physical. Um, again, people think that perhaps this is an escapist thing or maybe very narcissistic to have avatars. But I think it's also very empowering because if you can get to know yourself through your avatar, and the avatar allows you to, experience, uh, to kind of project the truest form of yourself, and maybe that's a little different from what you were given in terms of physical form, but you can pr project what you really feel inside with your avatar. I think that's a way of really establishing an empathy with yourself that can be very empowering and, and really kind of help with the the situation today where the media just tells us what we're supposed to be instead of letting us be who we really can be. So again, this is what I'm calling the ultimate selfie, and I think it might be the next best thing to uploading our consciousness. So now, I have a lot of time left. Um, maybe I could take a couple questions, and then we'll start the panel, which will have a, a more interesting uh, discussion on this topic. So, if that's all right with the organizers, Zoe, can I take a couple questions? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. In here. That was very fascinating. Thank you very much. Um, how close do you think we are to a world like that, where um, if you were to say 10 years, 20 years? I think it depends on somebody needs to fund it. So okay. I, I know there are some people working on um, AI architectures that support learning for these kinds of digital constructs. Mm. Um, I think Mark Cigar's work is really interesting in that regard, and we've had a couple of discussions. So I do think um, the, the AI architecture has to be in place first. Mm -hmm. And then the, the other things are pretty much almost in place, the being able to scan yourself and, and really have a good... Um, form of yourself, you may want to do that at different periods of your life, and um, so that, that's kind of out there. The um, getting it to learn is the, is the big one, and I think that if we got funding today, maybe 10 years, but maybe a little longer. Okay, thank you. All right, I get to the next person. Uh, what are the poten what's the potential for misuse of this kind of technology? Well, you could get people masquerading as people they aren't, or um, there is the possibility, I haven't thought about this too much, but somebody could steal your digital double. Um, 
they could hack into your account and put some really bad memories in there. But I think we could deal with those problems when that time comes. Getting, getting it to work is the, is the first thing. And then building in the safeguards so that those things can't happen, I think, should be part of that. Thank you. You're presenting on academic achievements. Um, would you think that there might be commercial efforts in the same space that might be ahead, but they are just not shared? I don't know of any commercial efforts that are there in that. Um, uh, I, I would be glad to be surprised by something that comes out that's not being shared yet. Hi, uh, do you think in the future, if this was, if a lot of people have got avatars, that they might be able to deal with, the younger people might be able to deal with death? Because they'll always have somebody there. It, we, we have a hard time dealing with death now, so who knows, this might be a comfort to some people uh, to know that they could leave that much of themselves behind. Um, I, I think in terms of thinking about what we leave behind, this this idea of leaving an entity that can behave like you and that could answer questions like you is a lot more comforting to me than leaving behind a photograph or a videotape of me because that's sort of a dead passive thing in its own right where I see this as a living entity that um, still has viability that uh, can, can go on for many, many years. Would, would you have any concern with people maybe just, just living through their avatars like you see like the film surrogates described? That's a good question. Um, there are people whose main rich social life is through their avatars now for whatever reason. They might be totally you know, bedridden and they can't get out and, and they yet they can have a, a very strong social life with avatars in a, a virtual space. Um, we find, I've worked a lot with veterans and the veterans, when they come back, if they've got some psychological damage, they really don't want to be out there with physical people, but they don't have as much problem being in the virtual world with others appearing as avatars because they can control the form by which they're perceived and they have a sense of anonymity because they don't really have their own names out there, so they don't feel like there's a risk to their career or whatever in, in entering these virtual worlds. And I actually call them the, the VFW Hall of the 21st century. Um, which was a place where veterans could go gather after World War II, and we don't have that now because they're very dispersed. So I, I see a lot of groups using the virtual worlds as, um, as somewhat their primary social outlet. Thank you. Hello, could you speak a little bit more about the emotion recognition research and where it's at now, please? It's pretty sophisticated, and you can go see that video on, um, on the ICT YouTube channel, so just look for Sim Sensei. Um, it recognizes everything without putting any markers on the, on the physical person's face. So even just voice prosody can um, send signals to the virtual human who interprets those as happy, sad, uh, edgy, whatever, combined with the body movement. So it's... it's a a system where all of these signals together are pretty well known to indicate certain emotional states. And the virtual human has been designed to recognize those. But it's pretty simple. It's facial recognition of expressions, it's eye tracking, it's head movements, it's body movements, and it's voice prosody. Those are the main ones. And um, Sorry, uh, in terms of the avatar living well beyond your life, um, how do you see that learning to happen with society? Do you see it as a, that you would be a person kind of stuck in time in terms of, I don't know, societal ideas on gay marriage or migrants or whatever? You know, would it continue to learn with society or? That's a good question. You know, I, I don't know whether your, your avatar that you leave behind would be able to continue learning or not. That's, if it had that learning algorithm in place, I would think so so that it would continue to know about the experiences it was having. Whether it would know about societal things going on, I don't know. That would be another kind of module that you might want to put into this AI entity so that it, it was aware of that. Or you might want it kept at that time period. 
So it's, it's a big question, and, and first we have to get it out there, and then I, I, I'm a f big fan of that uh, line, the street finds its own use for things. So hopefully we'll find good uses, but um, adding modules like being aware of what's going on in the world 200 years after your death is going to be an interesting one. I think that the panel now that's going to join you is probably going to discuss that even more as to whether humanity is in fact a digital construct. And joining, thank you very much, first of all, Jackie, if you could give her a round of applause. Thank you.